you, David. During the uh, long disaffiliation process and discussions uh, that were taking place in many churches, not just our own, uh, pastors would share stories together of uh, what was taking place in their churches and uh, how their process was going and uh, what was being said in some of those disaffiliation meetings and how uh, many of those meetings were becoming uh, these great teaching times uh, about uh, or where we were able to lift up the scriptures that we hadn't lifted up in a long time and, and teach on them. And, and some of that took place in uh, our church as well. We had uh, some great studies that were taking place during our discernment process for disaffiliation, but also uh, great teaching time on the Wesleyan faith and where our foundations are and all of that understanding. And this wasn't just in our church, but this took place in a lot of churches. However, one particular story that stood out to me was uh, a UMC pastor telling me about a disaffiliation meeting uh, that he was having in his church and a discussion that was happening around uh, some Paul's, some of Paul's words in uh, his letter to the Romans and Paul's teaching about human sexuality in the Roman text. And after the discussion, he said that one of his congregants stood up in the church and said, so now we're going to listen to this guy, Paul? You know, like... Somehow we didn't listen to Paul before, and, or at least we could pick and choose uh, what we want to believe about Paul and what we don't want to believe. He said, this guy, Paul, this guy who saw Jesus resurrected, it was kind of a shocking statement uh, by a congregant, maybe a, a good reflection on how uh, many think in the church these days and about maybe how some of us think about our faith as well like there's uh, choices that can be made on some of this stuff uh, last week we left off with the thought that the church has all the answers to all the problems in the world and we we all believe this right we all believe that jesus is the answer to all the problems but uh, it's not as simple as just uh, saying jesus and all the problems are solved uh, there is some discipline some spiritual discipline that is required on the part of congregants and on the part of churches and we talked about last week how the idea uh, tied into this idea of scriptural holiness uh, from the Pauline text and also from uh, the Global Methodist Church, the Wesleyan tradition. And then we finished off last week's sermon with the question, if Jesus is the answer, why does it seem like many people are not listening anymore, or at least listening less and less to the idea that Jesus is the answer to things? And then I finished off with the suggestion that the answer to that question may have been found in uh, that Acts text uh, where Peter is speaking to Ananias and Sapphira uh, from last week. And he says that uh, Satan has gotten a hold of them. And so I finished off last week with the idea that Satan had maybe gotten a hold of some of the church. And that's where we left off, that it doesn't take long for Satan to do his work and get a hold of some people in the church. Satan. Satan uh, is a word that is generally not talked about in the church much these days. Satan is a topic that I think has been purposely avoided in the church for maybe the last 20 or, or 30 years or so. One brings Satan up in conversation, even in the church, and you get kind of looked at a little funny or perceived at the very least as being, being maybe a, a, a little out of touch with reality, right? Maybe that's exactly the point, too, from Satan, that... Uh, maybe that's what Satan would want us to believe. If Satan was getting a hold of people in the church, maybe he would want other people to think, yeah, uh, that person's crazy if they mention me, or uh, 
that person's too superstitious, or that person may have lost their grip on reality. Church isn't that serious. Church isn't a life or death endeavor. Evil and demons and the devil and all that stuff, that's all from the Middle Ages sort of church. Now, I don't want to sound like I've lost my grip on reality or anything like that, but uh, just to let you know, the, the Bible does mention Satan a lot, or the devil. Uh, the Bible mentions Satan or the devil roughly 54 times, depending on the translation you're using. Satan is mentioned at the very beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis, in the fall accounts, and at the very end of all things, at the end of time in Revelation, in the Exaton account. Uh, some of that is from our reading this morning. In the Bible, Satan is seen as a malevolent spiritual being or a spiritual accuser or a spiritual adversary, like an opponent. Uh, also, Jesus uh, talks and interacts with Satan and the, or the concept of Satan a, a good bit in the scriptures. There's uh, Jesus being tempted by Satan in the wilderness for 40 days in Matthew 4, Mark 1, and Luke 4 in which Satan is tempting Jesus with various offers trying to divert Jesus from his divine mission. There is Jesus rebuking Satan in Matthew 16 when he turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan, referring maybe to Satan getting a hold of even one of Jesus' most loyal followers at that moment. There's Jesus teaching Uh, using the concept of Satan or demons to illustrate spiritual truths. For example, if you read Matthew 13 in the parable of the sower seed, these are Jesus' words. If you go back to that, you'll catch it. Jesus refers to, quote, the evil one who comes and snatches away the seed sown in the hearts of people. The evil one snatches the seed away. There's Jesus referring to his authority over Satan in Luke 10 when he tells his disciples that they have authority over demons and declares, quote, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And then there's finally all of these exorcisms, Jesus frequently casting out demons, evil spiritual beings. Jesus cast them out. In Mark 5, we know that he, Jesus casts out a legion of demons from this guy, and then he throws all of the demons into a herd of pigs. The bottom line is that Jesus mentions or interacts with Satan, demons, the concept of evil forces a lot in the scriptures. His teachings and actions, they, they point to this spiritual warfare between good and evil that's going on in the world. And, and then the ultimate victory of God's kingdom over these evil forces with Satan at the head of these evil forces. Of, uh, and this victory that takes place at the end of times in the book of Revelation. So we do know that there's an end to this battle. It's in the book of Revelation, right? But we don't live in that time. We live in the in-between time. So what this means is this battle, this idea of evil forces and Satan and demons uh, is still real and still goes on today. When I was a kid uh, playing high school football, playing in the greatest high school football program that ever existed, uh, not the New Brighton Lions high school football program, but the Beaver Bobcats high school football program. My wife's like rolling her eyes here. (laughs) Anyway, how that worked is uh, when, when we were there, our practices were two hours a day, and each day we basically consisted of the first hour as we would do team offense, and that would be our first string offense against our second and third string defense. And the second or third string defense would be running plays that our upcoming opponent would be running. They'd be running defenses that our upcoming opponent would be running, right? And then the second part of the the practice was team defense. So our first string defense would be going against uh, 
our second and third team that would be running offense uh, the offense of our upcoming opponent for the week ahead. And the point of that was, is that um, that's all we did for two hours, right? We practiced against our own guys, doing what the opponent was going to do. And our, the point of that was in order that we might better know our opponent, right? It's simple. We might better know our enemy, and it is the same thing with spiritual matters, too. If we're going to win a victory, if there's actually something going on between good and evil, if we're going to win that victory, and what is the victory? The victory of Christ on the cross, his righteousness imputed to us through his sacrifice, thus washing away our sins through repentance and faith and the consequences of sin, meaning death, the victory of Christ's righteousness, death to sin through repentance and faith into eternal life. That's the victory I'm talking about. If we are going to win this victory, we have to know our enemy, right? We have to know our opponent. So we have to talk about this stuff. We can't just leave it alone because it scares us or we don't quite fully get it all, but we have to talk about it. Like the, the ball team that studies film or, or practices uh, against the upcoming opponent's offense, we have to know our adversary. And our opponent is the evil of this world, the evil of our sin, the evil of our culture. And yes, yeah, Satan is the head of all of it. So back to the beginning. If the world is unwilling more and more to listen to the fact that Jesus is the answer, then Satan has gotten a hold of some of the people in the church. Why or where do I see this lived out in the life of the church? Well, there are many ways uh, that I see this lived out. Mainly, I think, is uh, because we love our sin, we are constantly trying to invent ways in which we can remain in our sin as followers of Christ. And I think that is Satan's strongest foothold on the church today. Satan's draw on the people of the church is to constantly come up with an easier way, constantly trying to invent ways or theologies that just say that God doesn't care about your sin as long as you are nice and loving and non-judgmental towards others. And because our culture is in love with their own sin, hearing this, one thinks that they can remain in that sin then, right? And that one can get salvation and victory in Christ without going through any hard work, without going through the hard process that is required in Scripture and required by Jesus and by Paul and by John Wesley. This movement that we talked about last week, the hard process of hating sin and dying to yourself and putting on Christ and repentance and submission to God and his ways, which requires a lifelong of learning and holy living. Or as Wesley in the Global Methodist Church would say, scriptural holiness. If we aren't willing to do this, or by hearing that uh, all of this is not important. Uh, it's just easy for our churches to fall apart and embrace a culture that is not with Jesus at all. I'm going to be honest here. Uh, my entire career as a United Methodist pastor, and I've been a, a Methodist pastor for 15 years. Uh, before that, I was a, a truck driver. I spent uh, a lot of years uh, wanting to be a pastor and working to be a pastor. And after I became a pastor, my entire career has been spent in meeting after meeting of, quote, trying to reimagine church. Uh, that was uh, a huge push in the United Methodist Church. Uh, to reimagine church for the current and future culture. You know, trying to present the gospel in new ways in order to speak to the constantly changing world that's happening around us. But very early on in my pastor, maybe even before I became a pastor, I, 
I believe that maybe Satan had gotten into some of the leadership, some of the pastors, and some of the churches. Uh, and we went from reimagining how we present the gospel to just reimagining the gospel. Do you see the difference? Reimagining how we present the gospel to reimagining the gospel altogether. So we went from, does Jesus really care if we play some contemporary music, you know, break out a guitar every now and then, uh, to does Jesus really care what I tithe or if I tithe or what I say or who I marry or if I'm married at all or the greatest sin that's out there can, uh, does Jesus care if I'm judgmental or if I hold anybody accountable to anything or uh, maybe speaking the truth of your faith, uh, being offensive, so it's a personal thing, you need to keep quiet about that, which led us to churches that are now full of people that I think are vaguely spiritual, um, require almost no commitment from their members, detached from a life of faith beyond uh, the 15 minute sermon that they expect to have in worship with a little inspiration and maybe a little self-help in the sermon, but don't force it down my throat sort of sermon, which has led to churches like this, the Star Wars church. There's Princess Leia as Mother Mary. What does that have to do with Jesus? Or this one, the Sparkle Creed. Thankfully, you can't read it. It's taking the Apostles' Creed and just making it an absolute heretical statement. And leaders that proclaim this, uh, they proclaim things like it's optional to believe that Jesus is the Son of God or that Jesus is both male and female, etc., etc., etc. So if you have members and you have churches and you have leaders of churches doing these things, and not the good old-fashioned Wesleyan and Pauline hard of scriptural holiness that creates a changed life and individuals dedicated to a community of faith that through its worship and its teaching and its accountability and its living bears witness to this radical changed way of living, then what do you have in the church? You don't have a victorious one in the salvitic sense, but a defeated one. And if you're defeated, then that means you're defeated by something. And what are you defeated by? Your opponent, your adversary, the evil one, or maybe even you could say Satan. Thank goodness the fight isn't over. And we know that Jesus is the answer and the ultimate victor, but we still as churches must fight the fight every day. We must do it, right? The Apostle Paul writes the letter uh, from the gospel reading this morning that Michelle read in 2 Timothy. Uh, it was a letter that was uh, written to one of his assistants, Timothy, uh, his protege, his understudy, whatever you want to call Timothy, uh, but Timothy came to faith uh, through Paul, uh, was with Paul during his first imprisonment in Rome, and was so trusted by Paul that uh, Paul would actually send Timothy to churches as his very own representative. So Timothy was very important to Paul. He was Paul's uh, right-hand man. Uh, in this letter that was read from, Paul is now in his second imprisonment in Rome, and this time it's very different than his first imprisonment. Uh, his first one was like a house arrest, and uh, this second imprisonment uh, was a lot worse. It was under the emperor Nero, uh, and Nero had been persecuting and killing Christians by this time, and so Paul spent this second imprisonment shackled, in a dark dungeon, sick, malnourished, uh, and facing imminent execution. In just a uh, short time after this uh, 
last letter of Paul was written, Paul's life would be taken from him. We don't know how the execution happened, but early church fathers, Tertullian and uh, John Chrysostom and Jerome, they uh, all say that Paul was beheaded. Uh, So most likely Paul was beheaded shortly after this. Uh, And during these last days, under uh, the stresses that Paul was under, Paul gets out this letter to Timothy. The letter is not really one that is written to uh, commend Timothy in any way, but really uh, what you find in this letter uh, is mostly Paul giving Timothy warnings about the days that are ahead. Uh, He gives 25 important warnings in this letter to the man that would be carrying on the church uh, without him. And then in the final portion, in the very last chapter, the last word that this guy Paul ever writes, this man who saw the resurrected Jesus, this guy who wrote most of the New Testament, this guy whose theology of Jesus, Pauline theology is the cornerstone, is the foundation in which all of our understanding of Jesus is built on, wrote these final words to Timothy, and I believe they were prophetic to all of us today in the church. I want you to listen to them one more time and listen carefully. Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge, the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. So I charge you in the name of God and Christ, who is judging the living and the dead by his appearing and in his kingdom, in which we are trying to reign victoriously. in. I want you to preach the word. Be urgent in season and out of season. Preach it whether you want to hear it or not. Convince, he says. Rebuke. Rebuke others. And exhort. Be unfailing in patience and in teaching. We must teach all about Jesus, but also all about the warfare. Satan, the demons, evil, all that there is concerning this teaching but having itchy ears or I'm sorry teaching for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but having itchy ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers who suit their own liking and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. As for you, Timothy, always be steady, enduring suffering, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already at the point of being sacrificed. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up before me the crown of righteousness, of victory, he speaks of, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing, to all who love Jesus and hold to the faith. Yeah, we're going to listen to this guy, Paul, in this church. And not the subjective whims of the world out there or the theologies of those that are just itching and scratching people's ears. We're going to listen to this guy, Paul, because for far too long the church hasn't. Satan has been tickling our ears. Glory be to the Lord our God, Jesus the Christ. Amen.